All right, mm -hmm. welcome to the first episode of Grendel the Devil in Detail. It's our I'm Eli Schwab. This podcast. is Ben Granoff, the, the new big Grendel podcast. Vivat, Ben. Vivat Grendel. Eli, Vivat Eli Grendel. is a cartoonist, uh, publisher, writer, zineman, grilled cheese dude, uh, tech guy, <laughs> all around, all around pop culture maven. Thanks, and dude. And Ben culture. is, uh, he teaches comic books and he is a scholar in the comic bookly arts, teaching at uh, the New York Film Academy, yeah, as well as teaching the youths of today, <laughs> the ways of comic bookery. Yeah. And in yeah. Ben's words, he's the Spangler, I'm the Peter Vankman, and that's all the set up you need because everybody knows Spangy and Vanky. And 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 Eli, I thought everyone knew uh Grendel, like the back of their hands, but but apparently not so. It doesn't seem to be that way. And guess what, Ben? We're here to take him through it. This episode we're gonna um we're gonna focus on the first appearance of Grendel, Kamiko Primer number two. Uh by Matt Wagner, uh also featuring stories by Victor and spirit they weren't as lucky as grendel sure sure oh uh, eli what is grendel I, I'm, I'm curious what is grendel it's a comic ben it's been around <laughs> for uh, almost <laughs> 40 years so it's it's bu that's right uh, this first it's issue came out in 1982 so it's a little bit older than me uh are we the same age uh maybe i might be like six months older than you 1984 though I'm, well, I'm July 83, yeah, so. Oh, uh, that's a whole yeah, year yeah. later, Ben. Anyway, <laughs> but this work is older than both of us, and it's it been through a lot of different publishing houses and, and uh, ups and a down, but mostly ups. And Yeah, uh, and, and about the book itself, I would wage to say that it covers more time, a, a larger spread of time than any book you could possibly compare it to. Sure, the scope is epic, to be sure. The scope is epic. Now, it's maybe it. here and there we've had a flash forward of like, you know, Guardians 2099 or whatever these things are, but never did we actually see the progression like we see here in Grendel. So this book is, uh, as, as its creator puts it, it's an examination of human aggression. And uh, it's also a study in creative reinvention uh, from the format th that the stories take to the aesthetics that they encapsulate, um, and just the general innovation uh, within the comics medium. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something to behold. And it's not necessarily something that people come into reading from the beginning. They might get a random book. It's, it's kind of easy to pick up the gist of what it's about. Mm -hmm. And that's when the curiosity hits you between the eyes, my friend. <laughs> There's so much variation and so much, um to be had within this book. So like, maybe if you didn't like one variation, you can pick up another and it's, you know, the through line similar, the Grendel, which, you know, started as a person and Matt wanted to grow it. And it grew to the point of where it's like a group of people to where the Grendel con rules the entire world to where yeah, it's kind of like how a vibe, you know, the vibe takes over. The spirit, exactly. of, the need, the need to dominate, um, uh, shapes the history of uh, the world and its cultures. There's exactly. a, there's a wonderful quote from way on down the line in one of the Grendel tales. It might be one of the last ones. I think it's Devil May Care. It's the uh, Skiff Racing Indy 500 one. Oh, that's um, the great one. But, oh, it's so good. It's one of my favorites. It's where the uh, the hospital administrator falls in love with the Indianapolis Grendel Khan. And they're like, we got to get out of here. We got to have a life out away from this craziness. And I believe the quote is, um, uh, the only, like, love is the best revenge on a world that worships hate. So there's some pretty, That's a good line. So there's some pretty <laughs> deep shit going on there. But it's also a comic book. And, and you know, if you like, if you like comics with, uh, Pulp Fiction Assassins, Wailing on Vampires and Werewolves. Boy, have I got a comic book for you. 
<laughs> oh, it's great. And, and it travels through, like we do get these main protagonists, but then all throughout the time, the, the um, you know, backup characters are equally as interesting and each step moves the Grendel mythos forward in, in a different way. Uh, especially like through love, through hate, through pain, like especially passing from Christine Sparr to Brian Lee Sung, you know, it's like completely different reasons and, and um, just j like I'm saying, completely different people and ethos behind each and every Grendel. So I mean, yeah, Matt yeah. made something beautiful. So obviously there's a literary reference in the title and the name of the character to, to Beowulf. Right. Um, so I'm not a great, I'm not a great literary scholar, despite my Herman Melville thing back here. All, all we um, get is Dick, so I wasn't sure. What yeah, you right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's yeah. what could be better. Um, it's, it's a descriptive but, sign. Yeah, but Grendel is uh, like, uh, you know, a, a demonic force of aggression and pain and murder uh, that a, a noble classical hero can go up against, even though the, 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 the antagonist, the, the Joker, has murdered everybody. Beowulf can still uh, overcome him. And uh, I guess maybe one thing that, that Matt has, is asking us as readers is, can it, you know, can, can we overcome uh, the negativity uh, within the, the human condition and uh, that's kind of seated within ourselves? Is, is original sin ever escapable? See, this is what you're going to get from Ben that I can't provide is the literary breakdown and scholaristically. Yeah, the faux profundity. <laughs> um, but, but before all that, before it was this generational uh, tapestry about culture and history and people, um, it was about, about just one dude. One man. Hunter Rose. There he is, as depicted, Ponce Grendel number one from yeah, Pinto. man. So he appears in uh, he appears first in Primer Two in an eight page story, and then in this three issue Kamiko series, and it's the tale of a lonely and misunderstood young man who uh, the text says he has a genetic mutation that allows his brain to work good or something like that. Yeah, he, um, he succeeds at everything he's he's with. Everything he does, he succeeds at amazingly. And nothing is a challenge, you know. And so, and so, uh, when you're a kid memorizing phone books and becoming the global fencing champion at 14, where else is there to go but New York City, baby? If you can yeah. make it here, you can make it anywhere. And what Hunter Rose decides to do is take over the entire organized crime on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. Well, actually what we figure out too is, is that, um, you know, his, his real name is not Hunter Rose. He's oh, born right. Eddie. He's Eddie. Yeah. Here's the first page of Grendel. And it, and it starts, it starts early. This is this, first of all, who is Matt Wagner? Who is Matt Wagner? Is Matt Wagner? Who is Matt Wagner? He's one of the, the nation's greatest cartoonists. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with you too. And this is his first, I believe, his first published professional work. At yeah, the professional, I think that he did some smaller stuff. Okay, before. like fanzine yeah. stuff or something. But he was probably so. um, like 1920 and 21 when he was doing this work. Agreed. A very, a very young cartoonist. Um, and it's, you know, like the, the great cartoonists that we admire, the early work is a study in development. And this work is is pretty good, you know. It's in in the intro to uh, the Grendel Archive, which is I think the only place that reprints this material. He says uh, something to the effect of, um, "Am I am I embarrassed by this work? Well, that would be like saying I'm embarrassed of having once been seven years old, right. or of having once been 21 years old. Which, as a you know, a, a grown adult is you know, if you're reflective and creative, is you know, why bother?" Right, and, and his art, you can clearly see, I mean, you can clearly see shades of where he's going, but much of the figure work and the look of characters 
is really going to change. You know, like if you see there right here by my finger, you get some of the long leg, big feet type of um, maybe American anime type of feel almost. Mm, yeah, I'm definitely and, um, sensing more uh, Alley Oop and E.C. Seeger than I am like Jack Kirby and John Buscema or, you know, whoever Wagner enjoyed in the comics, Carmine Infantino, you know, growing up in the, in the 60s. So it definitely right. has, uh, or, you know, like a Von Bode look, definitely has like a child of the 70s kind of flair to it. For sure it does. Super, super cool. A lot of really great uh, cut screen tones and shading techniques like that. Um, yeah, where's the one with the fencing where, the, where the, the grade on the screen tone gets darker and darker and darker? And he just well, wins. I believe that's in issue one. Oh, excuse me. I wouldn't want to get, I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> well, I mean, th there was a panel that you were saying too, where it was like someone's face. Was it this? Uh, it's a face like that. That might also be an issue one. Here we've got, um, you know, the only place where young Wagner seems to stumble a little bit, I think, is on uh, a few spots inking that werewolf argent. Some of the, uh, whatever, you know, <laughs> like I could cross hatch that good. Um, but one thing that I really like on this is that I think it's like this very second page uh, is a, there's a high society party. Um, and that's a scene that Wagner has drawn over and over again in Grendel, in Batman, in Mage, you know, classy stuff. But here when he draws it in his like fifth professional panel or whatever, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. It's got almost like, a, I don't want to say like a Roy Lichtenstein vibe to it, but it's definitely got that 70s vibe. It's definitely storytelling by a young man who is trying to storytell something that he doesn't really quite understand yet. Because it, it looks like a rager, but it takes place in a ballroom. Right. So you're saying perhaps maybe Matt hadn't actually been to a... Well, you know, it's, it's <laughs> something that he's... That it's a scene that, he's tack that he tackles many times right, in the future. Moving forward. And it's, all, because, it's, much, it's much different. Because Hunter Rose kind of exists in two worlds, you know? I mean, he exists as Grendel, but then he exists as this high society um, author you know, who's the, the nation's best-selling author, um, author of such books as the hit My Little Chickadee. And there Creon. Were other ones. Creon, Glee Club. I don't know. They're not real books. And what, yeah. So I have a lot of questions about that. But when he writes those books, he's all of 19, 20 years old. Right. And much everything. like his author. Yeah, just like his author and his creator and everything it's a character everything comes easy to and then there's another component to hunter rose that he doesn't even know about and it's the fact that he's under some type of demonic archetypal possession right that's an idea that gets ex explained later on um but you know it's not all, just like a cape and cow or a mantle it's like it really is like a spirit it kind of comes to yeah i think that if you were to kind of describe um the character to someone who's really never encountered it you might want to start with batman like kind of like a warped version of batman and the joker and in, in grendel and argent um and i wouldn't want to say what if batman were the villain because that's like just too simple, but that's not a horrible place to kind of to kind of start out. Yeah, because it's kind of like the dark, the the man of the night, the um, that type of feel. Uh, here's here's some of the origin pages. I think that maybe you were talking about. Yeah, this is. I think it's maybe the next one. He's yeah, he's fencing here, and then on the next page, he's like winning match after match after match. Ah, there we go, yeah. Right? And then you can see there's a little bit of the, the, the fencing blade has that, that nice little scratch out. And he's, he's basically oh, using right. the same move to win every time because it's, he could just do it over in his sleep. Right, he's just so good. Yeah. Anyway, right, right there you can see the hole that's in my issue somehow. Yeah, oh, God. <laughs> so he did, oh, I got he, it, they're cheap. He did three issues of this. 
of this volume one and then um, started doing his, uh, his other creator owned book, Mage. And by the time Mage was picking up, he said, well, let me come back to this and revisit this material. And um, Backups in Mage became uh, collected as Grendel Devil by the Deed. Right, which is a great place for anyone who's coming into Grendel to, to dip their toe in, get wet, just <laughs> meet the character. Really, what I do with that is anytime I see one in the wild, I buy it. Yeah. And then I give it to a friend Absolutely. that I'm trying to get to start Grendel. Yeah. And there's even a few printings. There was a Kamiko printing. I think there was a, there's a Dark Horse print. There's the um there's a hardbound, uh very uh handsome edition. Yes. <laughs> that you have. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I get, I get, I try to get stuff on the cheap, so I got it without the slip case. Mm, yeah, 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 like a hundred dollars cheaper. <laughs> yeah, that's like my uh, Electra Lives Again hardcover with no dust jacket. Exactly. Um, yeah, and and when you read that book, I think the part that's like super, super cool is that there's a lot of gaps in the storytelling, and the presentation is very, uh, it's it's very different for a comic book. Um, it's it's like montage pages with blocks of text. And, and really beautifully, like Matt is an amazing designer and he focused, especially with this book and, and many of the Hunter Rose books on a art deco kind of feel, like a great Gatsby type of, and I guess that's another thing with the world that they paint. It's never really much like the shadow or much like um, the, the spirit or something. It's not necessarily clear what time period it, it is. You know, is it the yeah, 80s or like the a, 60s? Like Batman, the animated series, in a way where it's Art Deco, but they got computers. Exactly, yeah. I uh, which I think is great. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of kind of 80s excess commentary in those early ones, and, you know, through Christine Spar. Where right. it's and I guess you kind of do get a uh, time frame nailed down because it, it seems like. It seems like Grendel's in the 80s, and then Christine Spar ends up being in like the 20s, the late 2000s or something. And yeah, well, you know, there's there's always, if not a flying car, then a floating traffic light, exactly, you know, or something like that to kind of give you just a just a touch of sci-fi. And I think that you know, when I was younger, and I would sort of ask questions about, like, the really, you know, pin it down. I want to understand this fully. Uh, kind of questions. Now the answers are more like it's a comic book. Like you have to, like have fun because it's a comic book. Um, right. And also the other thing that I that I realized in doing my my research on this one was that um, the Christine Spar issues, which are drawn by the Pander Brothers, they were young guys too at the time. Right. Like I don't I don't want to say nineteen to twenty two or whatever, but it's, it's something like that. It seems like that's when you start on Grendel is nineteen to twenty two. Yeah, I guess I, I guess so. so I, I, and also, I, it um, Grendel grew to be one of the longest uh, print runs. I think it was probably the longest running book that Kamiko had until you know the end of its of the Grendel Christine Spar run. And that's about 39, 38 it's, issues. I think it's a, it's up there. Yeah, it takes and that, and by that time it sort of takes you into the future and it moves. It moves on from the idea that this is a demonic possession book that jumps from one person to the next um, and, and kind of goes more into how <laughs> demonic aggression infects society and, you know, products and culture and war and politics and whatever. It all started because Christine Spars, she found Hunter Rose's journals and republished them, and then they in and themselves became a best-selling book, spreading the gospel of like the Grendel character. Right, and that what grew. You're reading in Devil by the Deed is Christine Spar's book, and we should say that Christine Spar is the daughter of Hun Hunter Rose's adopted ward. His ward. So there's all yes. kinds of Stacy Palumbo. Stacy Palumbo, yeah, and yeah. And that's really strange. You know, Wagner talks about how um, even before Stacy's introduced in Devil by the Deed, 
um, that there's, you know, uh, an element of kind of, I don't know, edible stuff going on with, uh, with Hunter Rose's, uh, his lover, the older Jocasta Rose. Um, and, you know, and those, those kinds of themes kind of grow and develop, you know, the one crime, you know, even though he's a crime lord, the one crime that Grendel won't abide is the exploitation of children. Um, right, and I think that's a meditation on his own, like, lost childhood or... Sure, sure. Yeah. And then that theme kind of develops into, um, you know, examining children who grow up too fast, you know, without, you know, usually without the exploitation. There's um, uh, Christine Spar's son is, is abducted by Tujiro the Ninth, the Kabuki vampire. Right. And then Jupiter Asante, the Khan's son, is uh, abducted for his own safety by the Grendel Prime Paladin. That's right. So there's all kinds of shit going on in this book. It's, it's, it's wild. It, and it, I mean, it's, it's uncomparable. It's, you cannot compare it to any other series because of, I think, something that Matt consciously did with it was always push forward and never dwell and, and nothing sacred, you know, no characters can't die, you know, everyone can die, you know, Hunter Rose died immediately. In the first story. Yeah. yeah. Much like Shredder in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, I think, I think that in the pantheon of creator-owned comics, if you had to compare it, you know, I, I'd be talking about Cerebus, for one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both books that kind of tell you the general structure of what they're going for and they're based on constant reinvention you know depending on what the author is interested in that moment and sure. then in terms of prestige i would talk about love and rockets and elf quest and other long-running indie books that are you know super creative in their storytelling and crafted yeah. with a deep eye to, to the literary Oh, for sure. And, and Matt's always talking about in interviews, uh, the Joseph Campbell, uh, the journey of the hero, the hero's journey, which, which, I mean, you can see it in so many characters in so many different ways. And even uh, the hero, the journey of the title of Grendel, you know, which goes from person to community, to drug, to army, to like all of these different different ways that it grows and and all the permutations, if you will. Yeah, sure. And then the other thing is that with with that Campbellian stuff in mind, you know, Mage really applies much more straightforward to it. And, sure. and Mage and Grendel are like two sides of the same coin of a character. And yeah. he said, Matt said himself that there would never be any world where they crossed over in any way. And I've, yeah, and he answers that question kind of quickly and curtly, like not wanting to explain it. Um, but I mean, for real, they so are so times. different. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think also, you know, like, is it, do you think it's because it would be too difficult for Matt to realize, uh, not to realize, you know, to have to have Grendel kill Kevin Matchstick? Uh, <laughs> you know, because that's obviously what would like, it would have to. It would but have man, to, I don't like, know. Like eventually, it would it would get him. Um, Kevin's and, got power, you know, and and Grendel just has. I guess Grendel could be Hunter Rose could be a mutant. You know, he's got heightened senses. He's got there's something in him that mutated to make him above human. You know. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's also like a self-diagnosis, you know, they didn't take, Eddie's parents didn't take him to a neurologist and say, what's wrong with their son? And they no. said, oh, uh, your son has a, a genetic cerebral mutation and he uses 75% of his brain or, or whatever yeah. it is. It's just something that like Grendel made up. And so like, you know, in that, it's like a self-diagnosis. In that way, he's kind of a, kind of an unreliable narrator. Actually, Ben, can I interrupt you for just one second? Of course. Um, I just want to bring in someone, uh, uh, an expert on the topic here. Perhaps they could uh, shed some light. Matt Wagner, here? <laughs> Unbelievable. 
as the audio connects, we welcome the creator of Grendel. There we go, buddy. The one and only Matt Wagner is here. How you guys doing? Great. Hey, well, Eli, I, don't, I know you. I don't know you, bud. Hey, Matt. We uh, we met in October at the Javits Center, and you were pretty gracious to me and given me some eyes on my book and prints and all that stuff. Oh, right on, right on. Yeah. What's your name again? Sorry. Ben Grendel. Ben. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good to see you again, man. Thanks, man. Nice to have you here. We're, yeah. we're super excited to get this project going, and what better way uh, uh, than with a leg up like this? So thanks. Yeah, right on. Yeah. We Go to kind the source, of, uh, right? <laughs> we um, determined that I'm very much a Peter Venkman and Ben's very much a Egon Spangler as far as the... Uh, <laughs> so uh, you can see Ben really has an eye for the details and the, and the, the just the intricacies of it all where I'm, I'm more of kind of the, the fun, the, the general humor. Overview. And, yeah, the vibe. Exactly. But I mean, we've both been through it a bunch. I've got the old school. The originals, yeah, right on. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you don't mind, we, we all obviously would like to extend the invitation to you however many times you'd like to be a part of the podcast. Sure. Because, um, you know, the ability to go directly to, and pardon the word, the horse's mouth, mm -hmm. to get, uh, you know, to get the straight dope. I think yep. we're pretty psyched on that. Sure, I would suggest let's do it like in uh, in segments, like let you guys get through a, basically a certain period of Grendel, and then uh, and I could also probably hook you up with a variety of the various artists that were involved as well. Um, that would so. be amazing. And I spoke with Diana, and she uh, is interested in coming on to talk oh, about great. her book. Great, mm -hmm. yep. Which is awesome. <laughs> so yes. if you don't mind, we'd like to really talk about since we're here in the beginning, we're starting off. We'd like to talk a little bit about the genesis and how the project kind of kind of came into your head i mean mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. 1982 it's the early early 80s kamiko's just starting now one thing i wondered is because i'm always here doodling character designs when did you first doodle that mask when did you first create the design that we so well know as the mask uh i don't know that i can give you an exact date but it was it was shortly before the publication you know we didn't uh things didn't work so far ahead back in those days. Now, of course, <laughs> yeah. book store distribution and everything, you know, you got to work so far ahead. But in those days, it was, you know, it was like being, it was like putting on a punk rock show, you know what I mean? You'd get a band together and two weeks later, you'd have a gig, you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, uh, so I was, I was, uh, I had met the guys that formed uh, Kimiko, the first publisher of Grendel, while we were all in art school together. And that was just, right. you know, sheer happenstance. I get people coming up to me and asking me, you know, how did you get started? And I said, I'm the wrong guy to ask because I just stumbled <laughs> into it, basically. You know, I met a guy on an elevator at school and he had on a, a comic, uh, uh, there was a group in those days called Creation Conventions. They were like the only nationwide convention. And he had on a Creation Convention t-shirt and I struck up a conversation with him and we both loved comics and such. Anyway, he was one of the initial founders of Kamiko, you know. Um, uh, uh, so they, they were just a bunch of high school buds who had this idea for, uh, independent publishing, you know, and, and that day, you know, you'd had, you'd had the example of Cerebus, of ElfQuest, of a very few other titles, but, uh, there was no significant, um, uh, publisher of that day. Brenda, come on and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> what up, dude? <laughs> How you My doing? offspring and color is Brennan Wagner. What's oh, up? nice shirt, Eli. Yeah. Hey, thanks, dude. Uh, um, and, uh, I was looking to do, uh, I was looking to do something that would focus on the villain instead of the hero. You know, Marvel and DC had had a few little forays into that, uh, at various times. They had a book called, uh, Marvel had a book called Supervillain Team-Up, and then DC toyed around with a Joker book for a while, which probably would do really well nowadays, but back then just didn't take off, you know, because it just seemed like all these characters were second stringers. The heroes were who you wanted to see, you know. Um, but when I was about 12 years old, maybe 13, I read a book called Grendel uh, by a novelist named John Gardner. And it told the story, the traditional story of Beowulf and Grendel, but all from the monster's point of view. Oh, wow. So all sympathetic to the monster, who in the book is mainly just is this isolated, mutated sort of creature who just wants to be left alone. And it's kind of a victim of uh, 
of violent tribalism, you know? Um, so I'd never read anything like that that told something from the villain's point of view and turned everything in its ear like that. Um, I also point pretty regularly to the work of Michael Moorcock and the Elric Saga as, you know, kind of the first thing I'd ever read where you had this uh, character you rooted for, but he, he, he did a lot of awful shit. He, you know, he was very, uh, uh, and, and he was a very unreliable hero, you know? Um, so that influenced me as well. At the same time, um, there was a big reference book at the time called The World Encyclopedia of Comics. And uh, uh, it was in there that I discovered two Italian characters, uh, one named Diabolique and one named Criminal with a K. And they had, they were very much kind of a prototype for me for Grendel. They were both kind of gentleman thieves who had uh, uh, their own kind of bizarre twisted code of honor, you know, and you got to remember these, these are in the days shortly after um, uh, Bonnie and Clyde and that sort of uh, new romanticism of the outlaw, you know? Right. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, both of them, both Diabolic and Criminal uh, had foreign films, uh, which again, in those days, you know, films based on comic books were rare and few and far between. Uh, in fact, there's a really cool one called Danger Diabolique, which is directed by uh, uh, famous horror director Mario Bava. That's a, just a ton of fun. You should check it out sometime. All right. um, so I knew I wanted to have uh, uh, my main character be a bad guy, and I liberally borrowed that title from uh, the novel Grendel. And then I set about designing this costume, like you said, Eli. And, uh, you know, like most people, uh, I find clowns pretty fucking creepy, you know? And so I was trying to come up with a clown sort of mask, a negative clown mask. And I did, I don't know, probably six or seven designs. And some of them were more more clownish looking than the uh, the final Grendel mask ended up being. Um, but that's where I started. That's why he has a kind of a, a spot on his nose. Um, wow. But what I finally ended up with, uh, to my mind now, I don't think I thought of it so uh, deliberately back in those days, but... Uh, what I ended up with, to me, looks kind of like a reverse demon skull, you know? So you have these concave images for the eyes and the nose, and then uh, horns and tusks, you know? Oh, and, yeah. uh, and so that's how, I, that's how I came up with it. At the same time, uh, I had a friend, who was it? I can't remember the guy's name. But he had managed to lay a hold of a, uh, an antique uh, sword cane. You know, and, and, you know, we all just thought that was damn cool. You know, you twisted yeah. the handle and this blade came out, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I wanted my, you know, I didn't want my bad guy to have a gun because that seemed kind of unromantic and uh, commonplace, you know. Yeah. Um, so I decided to have him have this uh, cane that would turn into a weapon. And instead of a single blade, you know, I couldn't really have three, like a traditional pitchfork come out. But two blades uh, had a kind of... Um, had a kind of Asian uh, Asian weaponry aspect to it, um, and so that's how I ended up with the the fork as well. Oh, that's so cool. I I would have never thought the clown idea. I, I, like, I just didn't yeah, know. Like I said, it started like, there, but didn't yeah. it didn't quite end up there, you know. Yeah, but that's how, but that's how like, designing stuff works often, you know. Exactly. Yeah, it's got yeah. That kind of a punchinello flair to it with the yeah. you know the baggy cuffs and all that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Very cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so a certain, you know, uh, and, and it's obvious from anybody who knows my current work, you know, I was always a big Zorro fan. So there's there's definitely a, a several grains of Zorro in Grendel, you know. Yeah, and even the shadow, which you did great work with, and the crossover seemed so perfect. It's like those worlds melded amazingly. Ben, yeah, well, Hunter, Hunter Rose has always seemed oh. like a man who was born out of time, you know what I mean? He, he seems like he belongs in an era where more men wore tuxes and, uh, <laughs> you know, and everybody read great literature. You know? Oh, yeah. I, I wanted, yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit, little bit about Hunter because we've got this character that everything is easy. Mm -hmm. He's so accomplished before the age of 20, 21. Mm -hmm. um, when he talks in the beginning about, he, there's, a, there's almost a sense that he might be a little unreliable as a narrator. Oh, quite. <laughs> right? He, he <laughs> described, yeah. There's a big sense. Yeah, um, yeah. He talks about, uh, he's like self-diagnosing his genetic mutation that affects his neurology. And um, it's, he knows about that, but it, you know, it's not later on that in Behold the Devil that he discovers like what's really going on. Um, so I'm just kind of curious about, like, is that just something that he made up? He's like, shit, everything is so easy. I can walk into this, I can invent climbing tools, I can read a book on high voltage electronics and make this weapon. Um, 
you know, I'm a world-class fencer, but it would be, it would be a little more challenging to change up my weapon. Um, and then I really want to ask you about the novels that he writes. Like what, what could they possibly be about? <laughs> <laughs> I try not to define that because nobody could write that well. Right. That's <laughs> exactly know? what Ben said. It, uh, <laughs> like, I certainly couldn't write that well. You know? yeah. But, it, you know, his, his, uh, his ability as an author has an almost supernatural sort of quality to it where it affects almost anybody that reads it, you know? Right. Um, uh, and again, as I said, I, I just couldn't write that well, you know? Um, uh, so I, I leave that to your imagination. Like, for instance, uh, uh, the book he writes to sway public opinion on, on how and why he should adopt uh, Stacy, my little chickadee. You know, yeah, what's in that story? How, how, do you con how, how does a 20-something <laughs> man convince the entire world that he should be able to adopt a, a, a prepubescent girl as his ward, you know? But he did. <laughs> Instant classic. I, yeah. <laughs> I think it goes with this thing that we kind of, that you delved into later, whereas, you know, Grendel is more than a human. It's more than a mantle or a cowl, that it's um, uh, some sort of demonic entity that was able to travel through time. And that, that always made me... Not really. Yeah. I never, I never really define it that clearly. If you go and look, it's never really defined as that. Sometimes it seems like that. Um, I think that's what Behold I like devil. extrapolate. You mentioned Behold yeah. the Devil. Certainly, um, if you just take that at face value, uh, yeah, it seems to be that. But as Ben mentioned, Hunter's an unreliable narrator. And uh, so would a demon be an unreliable narrator? So is it that or is that an internal psychosis? Or is it a popular, uh, you know, later, especially when it reaches Brian's stage, is it, is it really a demon or is it his own uh, mind slipping oh. and a popular or is it a popular zeitgeist that just won't let go um so I, I never try and really 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 define it hard like that so so that's why that you would never there would never be a story that took place before hunter because if that would happen then it would almost prove that 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 is you know originally uh way back in the day when i was when all this was fresh to me and of course the uh the tableau ahead of me was was uh enormous and barren you know i toyed around quite a bit with going back and doing uh a, 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 a historical grendel before before hunter right. um and i just never went that path for kind of those same reasons that you just mentioned there eli um interesting uh it just would have nailed it down a little too hard and i i preferred to let it uh just roll as is you know that's awesome i love it matt can i ask you a little bit about your cartooning influences as a young man because mm -hmm. sure. when we look at these uh primer and volume one issues um i'm i feel like i'm seeing more von oh, yeah, just discovered anime <laughs> <laughs> you know, i just said that <laughs> <laughs> you got to remember too. In those days, anime was not the ubiquitous thing that it is now. It was yeah. it was very rare and mysterious to uh, to uh, American audiences, you know. Um, uh, so you know, I I I toyed around with that. Obviously, that was a passing phase. I, I dropped that eventually when I uh, uh, kind of rebooted the whole thing to become Devil by the Deed in the back pages of Mage. Um, but uh, but at that time, it seemed. Uh, um, it seemed daring, and it seemed uh, it seemed if I was going to tell this uh, really dark and violent tale, to tell it in these kind of deceptively cartoony forms seemed uh, mm -hmm. a, a dichotomy that appealed to me. Mm -hmm. um, again, eventually I I left it behind because I just decided this just isn't really my thing. Um, at that stage, I was still figuring out all over the place what my thing was. You know, I mean, I guess I'm still figuring that out. Well, a big part of your identity as a creator seems to be reinvention and innovation and keeping it interesting uh, for yourself. Um, in the intro to the Grendel uh, archive, you described the early work as burnt, born out of fervor, um, but nurtured with tolerance and innovation. Um, and, you know, when I think about your work as a storyteller, it's always about finding a new way to present stuff mm -hmm. to make us think um and to give us a new experience i was working with um my letterer this week and he gave me we're going back and forth and he gave me a note about well i don't want to confuse the audience the reader and 
I was thinking specifically about times where you've sort of challenged me to decode a storytelling puzzle or to give me something that I've never seen before. Eli, mm -hmm. can you hold up that page where Grendel talks to uh, Teddy Chacon and he's leaning up against the wall? That was and in Primer or? And it's in, um, I think it's at the very end of Primer 2. And okay. Matt, you put like nine little reaction panels flanking the border. And it's like, I'd never seen anything like that. And when I thought about it, I was like, it's pure Matt Wagner. <laughs> I will tell you, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Teddy Boy was uh, my college roommate. <laughs> uh, he pronounced it Ciccone, like uh, Madonna does, pronounces it Ciccone. Uh, I've had Italians tell me, no, it's Ciccone. Um, uh, but, you know, yeah, again, I was just always trying to uh, to not do what I was seeing in regular comics at the time, you know. Um yeah, I remember Go ahead, the, first, ben, yeah. the first book I ever read of yours was Faces, and there's, the, there's a bird's eye view shot of Bruce Wayne and the guy running around the track. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's like, you know, it, it, I was like, what the hell is this? And then you, you work with it, you're like, oh, this is what he's doing. And, and still, when, I gotta say, I'm still proud of that, the fact that that one reads so, as clearly as it does. You, yeah. Your head's kind of going like this as you're, as you're reading that with them running their laps, yeah. Another, Here's the, pen, the page, Ben, that you were speaking of, if I may mm -hmm. just show it off real quick and talk oh, so, so that great. the mic picks it up. And I feel like I've never seen anybody, it's so, it's, invention is like one of those things, you see it, and it's brilliant, and it's obvious, and you say, why didn't I think of that? Before? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, <laughs> there's tons of that, I go through tons of that too, you know. Uh, I'm always thrilled when I see something that makes me go like, damn, wish I would have thought of that one. <laughs> Yeah, man. Like uh, Mike Allred's uh, Mobius Silver Surfer issue. Yeah. Yep. Insane. Yep. Yeah. In best. fact, I was just reading. Um, my son gave me uh, Little Bird from uh, Image Comics. Ooh, um, I haven't heard that one. Oh, it's you'll love it, Eli. Um, and it's set in a, 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 a futuristic American theocracy, a North American theocracy, and uh, you know we kind of had that going on in uh, the Epi Thatcher run. And uh, they've got an American flag, and in, we're in the blue field in place of the stars, they have a Christian cross. And John Snyder and I were both like, damn, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That would have been perfect, too. Yeah. Oh, man. One thing, that, one thing that's really kind of stands oh, out about oh, wow. the series and the tapestry and the saga, or whatever you want to call it, is the aesthetic range that your collaborators have, um, you know, whether it's John Snyder or Teddy Christensen or yeah, that was extremely deliberate on my part yeah. you know you, uh, uh ben you mentioned there about you know me constantly trying to reinvent myself uh you know that's that's uh most significant in this book of course you know um in mage i'm uh, more than trying to reinvent myself i'm trying to just hone in on myself you know and uh and when uh when the publishers of kamiko first approached me about doing grendel as a monthly after uh, the backups in grendel or in mage excuse me um, I said, well, how are we going to do that? I just killed the main character. And then I started thinking about it. And then, you know, it occurred to me, perhaps I could treat this like the Phantom, the old uh, comic strip series, uh, where, you know, the, the Phantom, the current Phantom is, is not the same guy. You know, it's been a, a line of 20 different people who adopt the, uh, the guys and it moves on, is inherited basically by, uh, each, uh, former hero's son. And, uh, so at that time, I decided the only way I could do an ongoing series, a la what Marvel and DC did, was to continually reinvent it so that it would be a, an ongoing series of miniseries, basically. And uh, and we were just I was just determined that each one was going to have to look uh, vastly different and be vastly different from each one that came before it. And I think that's what's given it its really lasting uh, appeal is that you know, it grows with you too, you know, mm -hmm. so you yeah. start one place and then you're growing and your life's changing and then Grendel changes and you can pick it up. And yeah. And it's certainly, you know, I, uh, the, the, the roots of every storyline are in my life, you know? Uh, so like, for instance, uh, you know, uh, with Hunter, I grew up as an only child. I grew up in a very rural existence. Uh, my mom made sure I was extremely educated. I read a whole lot. Unlike a lot of my friends, um, so I always felt a little too smart for my own good, you know, a la Hunter Rose. 
yeah. with uh, with uh, the Christine Spar storyline, I uh, had a relationship with a woman that I went to art school with. We broke up, and then we, we got back together eventually, and she had had a daughter in the interim. So for the first time, I had this, like, up-close view of, uh, of a fierce maternal instinct, you know, and this pr maternal protective uh, 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 vigor, you know, uh, and a ferocity. Um, and then uh, after we broke up, I was alone, and I had dropped out of art school at that point, and I was living kind of all by myself, and I felt very alone in an urban environment, like Brian Lee sung. Um, and then I married into a big Catholic family, and that led into <laughs> Happy Thatcher and God <laughs> the Devil, you know. Yeah. Um, so everything, uh, you know, I always say that Mage is all me looking inward, and Grendel is all me looking outward, you know. Well, that really begs the question, then. Um... Did you have a really interesting uh, experience as a youth, perhaps at um, with a much older woman? No. Uh -uh. Yeah. <laughs> no, that would have been uh, okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will say that woman that uh, that I was hooked up with there, um, uh, Jocasta is based on her a bit um, mm -hmm. because uh, you know I was a total country boy. I was an only child. Uh, she grew up, uh, and you know I was very. Um, uh, you know, just straight up middle class. Um, she grew up very affluent and grew up in a city. And she was, okay. uh, she was tall and had, had a very, very womanly figure. And so I, you know, I felt very intimidated by her in many ways. And of course, that probably led to a lot uh, to the aspects of Jocasta, you know. That's interesting. Matt, the book and, is uh, sort of always on the cutting edge in terms of production. And because you own the property you kind of get to dominate you know i'm sure in a friendly way you're not your collaborators but the way that the book looks and uh the coloring process especially uh this week i had the first experience of comparing the kamiko coloring of the devil's legacy to the early aughts uh dark horse recolor right it was a really different experience um and now you've you and brennan have uh sort of started this like new era of of work. What what's it like to be reinventive in terms of process, and especially with a collaborator like your son? Process uh, the reinventions you're talking about there. The recolorings uh, mainly had to do with uh, uh, necessity from Camigo going bankrupt and the loss of all that printing film. At that point, it was on actual film. It wasn't digital files, oh, so wow. it was a, it, there was just sheer necessity to have it recolored. Um, uh, I, you know, most specifically, you can point to Devil by the Deed, which, of course, I colored the first version. The second printing that Dark Horse did was colored by Bernie Miro. And by that point, it was shortly after that, that we did the, uh, the various uh, Grendel Black, White, and Red, Red, White, and Black. And all of a sudden, that Black, White, and Red, that very noir sort of vibe, just clicked with Hunter and became Hunter's milieu, you know? Yeah. And that's why we eventually had Devil by the Deed recolored yet again into black, white, and red. Um, so uh, when, when we redo stuff like that, it's a combination either of printing necessity or in that, the case with Hunter, it was, uh, it was a situation where creatively it just seemed to make sense that now it should be like this, you know? Um, but, you know, color's always been a huge thing for me. You know, when I was working on Mage, uh, I was doing everything. I was coloring, inking, writing, uh, penciling. <clears throat> and I'll, uh, I'll never forget, uh, Eli, you'll love this story. I, I, shared, uh, I shared a studio with a bunch of guys in Philadelphia. And I was working, I remember distinctly, on the fourth issue of Mage. And I was just starting to figure things out. You know, it wasn't just slapping down color, like local color. Do you know what I mean when I say local color, guys? Like, uh, you know, this is peach. You know, this is blue. Um, uh, you know, light will affect, like, if I dimmed the lights in this room, this color would have a completely different cast, you know? Right. Uh, and, in fact, if you look here, the light hitting me on this side is different than the light hitting me on this side, right? Um, so I was just starting to figure all that out. And uh, so one night I went down to the studio because I, I wanted some alone time because we, you know, it was a group studio. And most of the other guys commuted into the studio. So they, uh, I knew they wouldn't be there late at night. And so I sat over in the corner of the studio and I rolled a couple of joints. And I just sat there and I got 
I got baked, and just all of a sudden, everything started to work for me. I was like, shit, <laughs> I'm on it, this is it, you know? And uh, so it was shortly after that that we realized that uh, I wasn't gonna be able to keep up this pace, and that's why we brought in Sam Keith to be the anchor on the remainder of the mage run, because I, I decided I would rather give up the line quality than the color. I really wanted to control that color because for me, the color had such an effect on the final mood and the final atmosphere. And of course, uh, Ben, you mentioned working with Brennan, you know, Brennan grew up in my studio, basically, you know, he, uh, he speaks the same language I do. And uh, so he's always, he always pays close, close attention to the effect that color has on the storytelling, you know. And he's really been, I mean, it's very cool too because like you said he grew up in your studio so you can see like shades of matt yeah but then you can obviously see this like yeah oh, style one of, my, one of my favorite things is when i give him something to color sometimes i'll have a distinct like I, I want this to look like this but often it's just like go ahead and he'll come back with something that was not what i was expecting at all you know and that's always a great joy you know it's just like wow shit that looks great that wasn't what i was thinking <laughs> awesome you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> And it's like that nice mix of um, creator and father pride. Yeah. And you're like, yep. huh, uh-huh. I done good here. <laughs> hey, let's roll back just a little bit, though, to the origins sure. of everything uh, and Great. talk about Argent because, uh, you know, my, uh, the creation of Argent had to do with the fact that, you know, if I was going to have this uh, suave, urbane, uh, uh, very handsome villain, my thought was I got to go the other way with the hero and I got to make the hero... Uh, uh savage and unlikable and ugly and uh you know i i think i went with the werewolf motif by the fact that grendel faced beowulf (laughs) (laughs) sometimes it's just as silly and and awkward as that you know uh uh but uh but uh uh it it really worked in regards to uh you know uh you're supposed to be on Argent's side because he's chasing this mass murdering villain, but you're generally on Hunter's side, you know? Um, You know, I always point out to people that uh, Hunter Rose and Hannibal Lecter appeared in print within one year of each other for the first time. And boy, they really bear certain similarities minus the cannibalism, you know? Um, (laughs) They both have this weird twisted sense of honor, you know? They both are very uh, uh, debonair and gentlemanly, and yet they'll both carve your fucking heart out a, with a second if for you know any reason whatsoever that that you know you spark them the wrong way. So there must have been something to water back then. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, I, when I look at Argent, Matt, like the one thing that always sticks out is the way you've designed the legs. The, the mm-hmm. behind back calf is. Uh, Really, it's a really disturbing design. I I would give uh, credit there to both uh, Bernie Rison's various early werewolf drawings and uh, mm-hmm. the movie The Howling had a big effect on me. Mm-hmm. Um, the the werewolf designs in The Howling. Uh, if you go look at those, at the end there's a little bit of stop motion stuff, and you get to see the werewolf standing upright, and it's mm-hmm. very it's very similar to that uh, that yeah. back leg that dog leg sort of look you're talking about. One thing that I that I really love about um, Devil by the Deed, particularly, is that it seems like there's story opportunity in every paragraph, in every sentence, and you know, in the black, white, and red stuff, different characters will get explored. Or you know, the uh, the literary agent one is one of my my absolute favorites. Um, is there kind of a limit on on how much mining? When does mining become strip mining? Yeah, I'm getting there, aren't I? I'm getting close. Because <laughs> Hunter had a very short life, and boy, I just keep digging back in that well, and the water's going to run dry eventually. Uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons I have that opportunity, though, is when I reworked uh, uh, the Grendel tale to be in the backup feature, what became Double by the Deed in Mage. Um, uh, and the reason that happened was, you know, we started off the 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 line of books of Kamiko in black and white. We, everybody, every one of the, the dudes that were uh, uh, part of the, the little inner circle of Kamiko did a book. And, uh, and they were just not well received. You know, Grendel got kind of the most uh, positive reaction, but uh, 
this is just before the black and white boom of the 80s. And so we decided we had to move into color production. That that was the only way to go. And uh, so they offered me uh, a chance to develop a, a color book since I was the only one that had gotten uh, some positive feedback. And mainly because they were doing another book that was written by Chuck Dixon at the time with his, uh, with his then wife. Uh, it was called Evangeline. I don't know if you guys know that. It was about a, mm -hmm. uh, a nun who's an assassin in the future, an assassin for the Vatican. And when you print uh, books, especially back in those days, it really helped your price point if you did what they called gang printing. The printing press was wide enough to do two books side by side. So we had room for two books, so we needed another book. So they offered me a chance to develop something, and that became Mage. Um, so then Mage is moving along and starting to get some attention. And I started to hear back from people saying, hey, whatever happened to Grindel? Whatever happened to that story that you just abandoned midstream? And at that point, I had no intention of continuing it. I thought that was an early effort that just didn't work out, and on to the next thing, you know. Uh, that happens to cartoonists and comic artists all the time, you know. Sure. Um, so I decided to give Grendel another shot and develop it into this backup feature in Mage, but that only gave me four pages per, per uh, installment. So in four pages, I had to tell a compelling part of the narrative, whereas before I had, you know, close to 30 pages in an individual issue in the black and white uh, books. Interesting. And so that's when I hit on the idea of doing it more like an illustrated novel with these chunks of prose. And you're reading it as if this is a fait accompli, you know, that uh, it's, it's a, a history of this character written by another character, a, a journalist in this world. And it's written as if you, the reader, are part of that world and already know about Grendel, you know, as, as we would all already know about, you know, Hitler or some other, some other major uh, uh, dark force in our world. And uh, so then that gave me the opportunity, uh, Ben, like you mentioned, with the black, white, and reds to go back and dig out a story from that, from the little sections that were hinted at in Devil by the Deed, but never fully explored. Um, so yeah, eventually, uh, <laughs> as you said, I'll be strip mining that and hitting bare rock eventually. <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff to explore and it seemed like, uh, cause you wrote all the black, white and reds. You wrote all those stories. Now, did you work? I think, I think you told me this before that you, you didn't always write for the artist, but- Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, I like did. Oh, you did everyone. Yeah, yeah. I wrote for all the artists, and I kind of—I okay. started off uh, each of them saying, uh, "What do you like about Grendel? Tell me, tell me what you tell me, tell me what you feel like drawing. You know, you know Grendel's narrative. What do you feel like drawing in regards to narrative?" And like for instance, Chris Sprouse said to me, "I want to draw architecture." So I gave him these eight full-page splashes, and I wrote these kind of evocative little lyrical, almost like they were uh, a dark children's book for adults. You know. Yeah. That's um, a Similarly, I had written uh, Andy Watson, who uh, did a book called Geisha for uh, Oni. I had written the introduction for his book. And as a thank you, he sent me a, a drawing of Grendel on this, uh, on this uh, stallion galloping into the sea with the sun setting in the background. So when he, you know, I was like, damn, now I, I got to write a story with that image in it, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so when he... Uh, uh, came on board. I did the same thing, but I wrote them almost as uh, not really haikus, but with a, a sort of haiku sort of uh, lyricism to the uh, uh, the captions on those. Um, other other people uh, here. I'll tell you a little behind the scenes tale here. Um, uh, the story that was ultimately uh, illustrated by John Paul Leon. Uh, ends with a very, very violent image of uh, Grendel is, uh, you know, inspired by the famous horse head scene in uh, uh, The Godfather. Uh, there's a uh, mob lord who's bucking Grendel's uh, rule, and he wakes up and and uh, and his his girlfriend's headless in the bed next to him. It's the last panel and that was originally going to be for Tim Sale, and uh, and Tim called me and said, "Can't draw that man. That just." <laughs> I just can't do it. I can't draw a naked headless woman. And I was like, yeah. okay, well, then I got to figure out a new one for Tim now. Now I will say <laughs> John Paul like knocked that one out of the, out of the park. That was, in fact, that was originally going to be wordless, completely wordless. And, uh, and when John Paul turned it in, it was, we, I just thought it was fantastic. But I said to him, you know what? This still needs some kind of verbiage here, you know? So I came up with one, a one word caption for each panel. 
So just one word. And, uh, and that worked out great. So that's, that's an example of how, you know, um, you know, sometimes you create on the fly, you, you get there by ways that you hadn't quite imagined, you know, I don't know if either of you've ever read uh, Stephen King's On Writing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little, it's a fairly thin book for him. <laughs> um, uh, and it's his uh, memoirs of being a writer and uh, not only his, oh, uh, his personal history of how he became a writer and how he went through the various stages of his career, but how he approaches writing as well. And, uh, much like myself, he's not really a copious note taker. Um, he tends to come up with a scenario and characters and then just kind of follows it through and sometimes doesn't even quite know where it's going to go. Um, and I, that's always been, I've always found that a very invigorating way to work. You know, it's a, it's a, it's kind of exploring, exploring the world through the story, you know. And, and that seemed to lead to these creative storytelling methods too. And, and, in fact, not only there's a different artist, but a different method of storytelling for many of the black, white, and red stories, yeah. Yeah. which is, which just let, lends to the awesomeness of it all. Yeah, and you know, I mean, uh, uh, that was, you know, that's part and parcel with working with, between those two series, there are 40 different artists, you know, and uh, God forbid I'd make them all the same, you know, that would just be, that would be just a, a tragic waste of potential you know i mean if you're going to deal with all these incredible stylists you know make use of their style you know fit your narrative to fit their style i want to talk gotcha. about a little bit about your style particularly your you know like i don't want to say your commission style but when you're working with mixed media and really handling the light a lot of tinted paper um and then going back to your published pages you do a lot of i guess graphite shading mm -hmm. Um, on on the ink stuff, I just wanted to kind of dig into your the materials that you're using and uh, what the evolution of that's been like. That uh, that graphite shading you mentioned is a, just an actually a Prismacolor, a black Prismacolor, a black colored pencil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've kind of fallen into that recently. Um, it's uh, let's see, where did I first start to use that extensively on the interiors? I think I first started to use it on some covers, um, and I would. I would say it was probably the stuff I was doing with Dynamite because Dynamite, uh, you know, had so many pulp characters. And, you know, if you look at the original pulp illustrations, a lot of those guys used uh, uh, a material called litho crayon in those days. Um, and it had a very textured sort of shading effect. And I tried to emulate that to some degree with this black colored pencil. And I've since just kind of stuck with it. Uh, Eli was holding up there a cover earlier, which had good old, old fashioned Zipatone on it, baby. Yep. <laughs> I used to, I used to use lots of Zipatone. And for people that don't know what that is, that was a, a sheet of, uh, uh, texture and or dot patterns on, uh, a sheet of, uh, clear acetate with, uh, adhesive on the back. So you'd lay that down over your drawing and with an X-Acto knife, you'd cut out the shapes you needed and you'd, uh, just slap that down. In fact, uh, if you go and look at the uh, story I contributed to uh, the Batman Black and White series, that was me using up the last Zipatone I had in my drawer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now, of course, everybody does it. You just push the button on a on a computer, and there you go. You can drop in any dot pattern or whatever you want. But in those days, we had to cut it out by hand, baby. Yeah, before it seemed like you used. Were... Oh, sorry. Go. Go. Before you came on, we were admiring the sequence. Uh, I guess in Primer Two, where. Uh, where Hunter is fencing and he's winning and it's the same, he it seemingly wins with the same move and then the Zipatone grid gets darker and darker and darker and you mm -hmm. cut out his fencing blade uh, in negative for, for each one. Yeah, because it's, it's uh, he's losing the thrill. Yeah. The only, the only thrill there is still the blade, you know, uh, but the, the opponent doesn't matter anymore because he beats them all so easily, you know. I was wondering one more thing too about uh, the first issue too, because you quote the Beatles in in that first uh, in number one. I do. There, what, what, I, I forget that. What do I quote? You know, I'm a huge Beatles fan, but um, I had to look the line up obviously because it, it said something like, uh, "It's like the old song says." Uh, I gotta check it out here. That here, there, and everywhere. It's when he's with Jocasta. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, is that when it is? Yep. Yeah. Were you listening lovely, to a lot of music? Lovely love song or? by Paul. Yeah. Were it's you always funny. listening to a lot of music then or? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Always been a big music hound. 
Uh, and what's really neat, uh, so uh, Brennan popped his head in there earlier. Brennan was out here visiting when all this corona craziness, when the shit hit the fan. So he's yeah. basically been trapped here uh, since. Um, uh, his wife has gone to uh, her parents' place. They, they live in Manhattan. His wife's gone to uh, her parents' place in uh, Virginia. Uh, she's actually, they're now making plans to go back because her job is kind of re-upping and uh, she's going to have to go back. But uh, so he's sharing studio space with me. He's he's here, and uh, quite luckily, uh, he's gotten old enough now that our music tastes have really matched. <laughs> and, uh, nice. And it used to be growing up, I'd uh, I'd be exposing him to music, and now it's uh, it's completely flipped. He's exposing me to new music all the time, so it's it's a great joy. That's awesome. I follow Brennan on Spotify, so every now and then I'll see, you know, you see the list of every of what everyone's listening to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh he's always i love seeing these different artists that you know maybe i've never heard of so yeah. if, every now yeah, and then same. i'll click on one that brendan's listening to and i'll be like damn this is it's yep. great you know yep. it's such a yep. cool way to find new music to see yep. like what your buddies are listening to or your son <laughs> it's the same right That's the same. <laughs> i'm assuming neither of you guys can do that yet but you know. <laughs> no but i do listen to a lot of good music with my dad you know and i've been yeah. i saw shows and seen fish mm -hmm. with my dad and, and mm -hmm. had some ex yeah, fun uh, experiences like that you know i always am into that i, I love hearing about what music is on when these creative things are happening. Well, you know, and if you look at Mage, each each uh, each Mage series begins with Kevin singing a song that all kind of reflect his headspace at the time. You know, that's right. Um, yeah, uh, Elvis Costello is one. Elvis Costello was the newest one. Uh, What's right. so funny about Peace and Love and Understanding? But the first one, it's a Stray Cat song about about being a young rebel. Uh, okay. And the second one is uh, A Town Called Malice by The Jam. Uh, ah, nice. Which is all uh, kind of. You know how you got to work to you got to work to defeat the darkness and make things better. You know. Oh yeah, very symbiotic with uh, the storyline there. Yep, yep. Gotta work. What was it? You gotta work with the darkness to make things better. I you like. Gotta, you gotta you gotta work to defeat the darkness. Oh Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I I don't have any more questions, Matt. That was that was really fantastic. Um, right on. Eli, do you have anything else that you wanna that you wanna talk about with Matt real quick? Um, I guess like just part of just part of the the parting with Kamiko because you were because Grendel was Kamiko's flagship book. It was it was its longest running book as well. Oh, uh, so, I don't know. No, they, I don't know. I don't think so. We only did forty issues with them. I'm sure they did more. Uh, uh, <laughs> not Galactica. What was the what was the Zeno anime attack or something? Uh, Robotech. 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 Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know how many issues of the elementals they did. I'm sure they did a bunch of those. Uh, oh, okay. Um, no, I mean, but, you know, luckily when Kamiko went down, uh, uh, you know, I, I will say a lot of the success of Kamiko can be attributed to uh, uh, Diana Schutz and Bob Shrek, you know, coming on sure. board. Her, her getting the ship in order editorially and, and Bob making sure that, you know, the we got exposed that we got PR that we got, uh, advertising and marketing. Um, and then, you know, once they left, when, uh, Kimiko went down, they ended up at dark horse and they said, Hey, you should, you should come here. And, uh, and like, so yeah. I did. And I've been there ever since. And, you know, I got no complaints with dark horse. They've always treated me really great. Um, Mike Richardson is a, a real, uh, advocate for creators rights and has always, uh, deferred to my, creative desires in in any way that's financially possible and yeah. uh so yeah it's it's dark has been a great home for for grendel and, and and i guess a good question we could end this with is with all this craziness have you heard any word about when the new issues of grendel will start coming out again no uh i'm expecting uh so what has everybody heard when is Dar diamond gonna start shipping again pretty soon right isn't I that's what i thought i heard too I, I got something from image the other day that said that uh books will be shipping like within a month so i haven't heard anything from dark horse yet uh when they uh when they put everything on hiatus like everybody had to do um i only had the last issue of the current grendel series to go yet so um so there's only that one for me to go um but this is a good time to point out that uh i have the sequel already in mind the next series uh uh 
is a is a cool shake up as well. So that was you know Ben, you were talking about shaking things up there. That's why I, when I came back to this Grendel narrative, the futuristic Grendel narrative, it just seemed to me we'd been in that world for a while. The world with the clans and the Grendels and the Khan and all that. Mm-hmm. And I just felt like, all right, I got to shake this up. Let's go into outer space. And you know, I have this character who's a cyborg. He's the only thing that could survive a, a space trip. Let's do it with him. And uh, and this uh, sequel I have in mind will shake things up uh, even more so. And that's and that's a, another paladin story. That's a, that's a uh, yeah. So that will be a Grendel Prime story. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, Very I was cool. see. I was thinking you had a whole new character, a whole new. Yeah. Well, yeah. There will be a cool new character in there as well, but. Uh, Jupiter is now grown and becomes. Oh, Jupiter's dead by this point. Jupiter's long dead. We're on. <laughs> oh yeah, I knew that. I knew that. Yeah, yeah. we're <laughs> we're about century or so. That's right. That's right. It's yeah. like yeah, yep. the last Grendel con. Yep. Yeah. Well, now that Mage is wrapped up and you've got these these books of Brennan under your belt, like Matt, as fans, the rest is gravy. Like do whatever. <laughs> just, make, just keep making. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, I I I also have a brand new thing uh, with a with a hot shit artist that I'm picked. I have pitched. That we pitched to Grendel, or we pitched to Grendel. We pitched to Dark Horse just when the shit hit the fan. So it's it's hanging out there, waiting for uh, review and approval, hopefully. But uh, something totally unexpected, not not Grendel or Mage. That that should be a lot of fun. Well, no matter that's what awesome, you do, man. it's always Psych. new and different. We we that's what we like you for. Thanks, man. Thanks. And I look forward to coming back and talking to you guys again. Absolutely, it's going to be a great journey. Uh, a hero's journey, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yes, it will be. Matt, thank you again so much. You bet. Thanks, fellas. Talk to you again. Amazing. Definitely. Thank All right, man. What an amazing interview with Matt, Ben. Super fun. Lots of insights. And, uh, you know, it's just like, <laughs> what, a, what a great way to launch this project. Uh, what a better way. way. Yeah, yeah. There what? is no better way. Yeah. And... Matt said that he is happy to help hook us up with some of these artists and writers and the amazing collaborators that he worked with on May on, on uh, Grendel. And uh, we're excited to talk to people, you guys that are big fans of uh, Grendel hit us up. You know, we're always looking for guests. We're excited to hopefully welcome Kevin from Mage the Hero Described onto the show because he has a great insight. I'm interested in talking with him about Grendel. Um, and I don't think we really explained at the start, Ben, that we're going to do a reread. We're going to do, we're going to read through, we're rereading the book with you guys. And, um, we're going to really try to stay sequential. And, uh, so if you want to read along with us, please do so. Pick up one, one of the Omnibuy. And, uh, what do you think, Ben? Yeah. There's six Grendel Omnibus? there's, There's six, including the two tales. Oh I, wow, and they're like thick. so thick. Yeah, well, I mean, one of them is the Greg Ruka novel, so it's you know, that's a hundred. Ah, they re they redid that in one of the omnibus. Yeah, that's, that's just that's just in there. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, man, I you know I I am excited to dig into this, and I think that we should be sequential for the most part. But there are so many gems stretched throughout this series that I I you know, including the ongoing, the book that's going on right now. Um, oh, and exactly. So, and when things get back to normal, it would be good to cover those as they come out. That's right. So then when the books come out, we'll also do that. So we won't be a slave to the timeline. And just like Matt, we're going to reinvent the cast. We're going to reinvent the timeline and we're going to, we're going to do it how we want. Yeah. yeah. And have a good time. And, and yeah. dig into it. Dig into it and have a good time. Oh man, it's going to be great. Uh, Ben, you had mentioned too that you haven't read every single issue too. So there's oh, going to be a right. point where where Ben's reading some stuff for the first time, which is great. Which is a great uh, uh, a great view to have. It's gonna it's gonna be a good. Yeah. Well, one of my oh, great good. confessions as a comics person is that I like to look at the pictures a lot more than read all the stories. Oh. So uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think own everyone the entire can. thing, um, and I've looked at it all many times. I just it's, you know, there's some parts that are particularly dense and I'm excited to dig in for the first time and, and kind of see what they're, what they're really all about. Great. Me too, man. What a great place to start. What a great place to stop. Grendel, vivat Grendel. We don't need to do the hand signal. It's, it's, 
reminiscent of. Is there a hand signal? Don't they go like this? Uh, <laughs> uh, why you didn't make the Grendel podcast? Oh. <laughs> nicht, nicht, Herr Wagner. Uh, of course, by two Udens. Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, man. Well, well I think... Great chatting uh, with you, man. That's good. Yeah. Vivat Grendel, Grendel, the devil in detail. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>